Every day, around 350,000 babies are born, each one utterly unique. A few months ago, this baby didn't even exist, and the story of how it came to be, against impossible odds, is extraordinary. This is the moment of conception. When one single sperm fused with the mother's egg, if another sperm had got there first, this baby would be someone else. So what made that winning sperm so special? Why did it succeed over billions of others? To find out, we're going to take you on the epic journey sperm undertake through the human body. And we're going to do it by scaling the whole thing up to human size. For the first time, we'll be able to appreciate just what an extraordinary journey sperm face as they try to reach the egg. It's one of nature's most spectacular stories, and it's the reason you're alive. The sperm will face death at every turn. There is no going back. No surrender. And only one winner. Glenn. Like most average men, Glenn has no idea about the miracle of engineering, tucked away in his pants. Glenn's testicles, hanging freely to be three degrees cooler than the rest of his body, are producing a thousand sperm with every heartbeat. And it's this tiny world of frenetic activity that fascinates the world of reproductive science. Sperm are really quite unique because they're almost like free living cells. They almost have a life of their own. They have but one aim, which is to deliver a genetic payload from the male to the female through a really quite complex series of environments, both in the male and the female reproductive tracts. Sperm move all over the place, and they like certain things, they don't like certain things. They're very smart little creatures in a way, and they're a lot of fun to watch in the petri dish because they're constantly in motion. And the fact that it's occurring at the microscopic level means that, as scientists, we have a great deal of difficulty in studying it and observing it. A sperm is just one five hundredth of a millimeter long. So to make things easier, Dr. Alan Pacey and a team of experts have agreed to help us scale up them and their world 34,000 times. Along the way, they'll give us practical advice on how to give sperm the best chance of reaching the egg, or what kind of sex to have and when to have it, to maximize the chances of conception. The first thing we asked our experts was quite simple. In our people-sized sperm world, what would a testicle be like? The testicle is, a, is a, a roundish, kind of oblong structure. If we cut it in half, we cut thin layers through it and looked at it down a microscope, we would see a, a series of tubules that you might liken to floors of a building. If we were to take a sperm and scale it up to man size, you would have to find a building that was about a thousand meters cubed, thousand meters by thousand meters by thousand meters. That done, we can go inside. Waiting in our giant testicle, an army of freshly created sperm. Just like the real thing, our sperm are split by gender, half-produced boys and half-produced girls.
The information needed to determine the sex of a baby is stored in a sperm's head. Here, we find their genetic package, 23 chromosomes of DNA, including the key gender chromosome, either X for a girl or Y for a boy. Situated just below the head, an engine of energy-producing mitochondria that propels the sperm's mighty tail through the female body. You could think of it as a very, very large office building where there's lots and lots of elevators and tons of people, maybe at rush hour, all moving in different directions. X and Y sperm are produced in almost equal numbers. Boys are thought to be faster, but the girls live longer. Once created, each sperm ends up in a structure on top of the testicle called the epididymis, a tightly coiled six meter long tube which can hold over a billion sperm. Imagine being crammed into a dark, winding, 200-mile pipeline with no idea when or if you'll ever get out. It's here, with no inkling of the horrors to come, our sperm must wait. fate now will depend on events unfolding in the outside world. In contrast to the billions of sperm produced continuously in Glenn's body, a woman like Emily, will produce just one egg per month. Reaching it won't be easy. The battle that sperm have in order to find and fertilize an egg is just immense. Everything is working against sperm. Um, they're not really given a helping hand by the female reproductive tract. You've got hundreds of millions of cells that are swimming wildly about. You've got a lot of death. You've got a lot of obstacles to overcome. They've got to make their way through a complex series of environments in a, in a kind of warfare. It is warfare. So if conception is a war, this is the theater of operations. From a sperm's point of view, landing in Emily's vagina is like D-Day. Their first objective, whilst under non-stop attack from the female immune system, is to reach a tiny opening high above them at the back of the vagina. From here, they can enter the cervix. The terrain in the cervix is completely different. This is a dark, treacherous maze of uncharted tunnels. The sperm will need to find a way through to the uterus. One wrong turn, and it's a slow, lonely death. In the uterus, Glenn's sperm will be looking for a doorway just a few sperm head wide in a vast, sterile area, where once again, Emily's elite defense force will be waiting to take them out. Then it's on to meet the egg. Timing is everything. Get there a moment too early, or too late, and you're doomed. Thanks for everything.
Glenn Sperm are just seconds away from participating in one of the most enjoyable experiences the human body has to offer. But what would it feel like to be propelled along a narrow pipe covering 15 miles in less than two seconds, whether you like it or not? individual sperm, this is a wet and wild, high-speed, one-way ticket to oblivion. They're not swimming, they're being forced there by muscular contractions and by peristaltic contractions. the point of view of the man, it's a very pleasurable experience. But let's think about it from the point of view of the sperm. Fifty million genetic couriers are about to invade Emily's body. Within minutes, most of them will be dead. But what chance does an average sperm have of succeeding? And is there anything Glenn can do to help his sperm along? To find out, we need to look more closely at the state of our seed, a ritual men like Dr. Alan Pacey have performed on themselves since the invention of the microscope. I was in my mid-twenties and I was a researcher before I plucked up the courage to produce a sample of my own semen and have a look down the microscope. And I remember the first time looking down the microscope, I was just blown away. I almost fell off my chair. I remember having to stand up and walk around the lab and go back and look down the microscope again. And is that, has that really come from me? It was just an incredible sight. The incredible sight of the sperm cell was officially discovered in 1677 by a Dutchman called Antoine von Leeuwenhoek. The godfather of microbiology, Leeuwenhoek, built some of the earliest microscopes, offering him the first, if slightly unclear, image of what he called animalcules, which he theorized contained the nucleus of a human and had a tail equipped with joints, tendons, and muscles. Later, other early microbiologists believed they could see tiny, fully formed people stuffed into each sperm head. Entering the uterus, would be quite a sight. 